Edward Snowden is a coward, he is a traitor, and he has betrayed his country. The man who leaks details of a secret telephone and internet surveillance program in the USA has disappeared in Hong Kong. If he wants to come home tomorrow to face the music, he can do so. They should use uh, every legal avenue we have to bring him back to the United States. I want to get him uh, caught and brought back for trial. I don't know how anybody can view uh, this person as anything other than a criminal. We've been telling him, get out, get out, get out, get out. You're going along with someone's life literally in your hands. Either our plan had worked and we would get on that flight, or it wouldn't. Just three weeks earlier, Edward Snowden, a 29-year-old analyst for the National Security Agency in the USA, was waiting for journalists he thought he could trust. In his backpack, he had nearly a million top-secret NSA documents. The journalists were traveling across the world, from New York to a hotel in Hong Kong, for a secret meeting whose outcome they couldn't predict. 105 North Avenue, 52 because I knew that what was waiting there was vitally important. But because we didn't know what really was going on, we thought there was even a chance. I mean, every step of the way kind of had all sorts of hazards. Thank you. The question mark that hung over us more than anything else was the fact that we had no idea who the person was that we were about to meet. So we were really just kind of rushing into this huge unknown. The documents Snowden had with him were so sensitive he could be in prison for decades for removing them. For all he knew, the U.S. authorities could have intercepted the communications of the journalists, and he was about to fall into a trap. I'd crossed the Rubicon at that point, and <laughs> actually, you know, I, I think, uh, I don't think anybody can reach such a clear turning point in their life without thinking alia yakta est to them, to themselves. you know, the die is cast. I had to expect that the most likely scenario was that I would be led out in handcuffs. How would we know that we weren't talking to some agent or somebody else? So the quite ingenious method that he invented was to hold this Rubik's Cube, and that was the first thing I looked for. After getting top-secret documents from Snowden, the two Guardian journalists published their first stories. They did not name their source. Edward Snowden's identity remained a secret. At the time, I thought he was paranoid. Once we were in the room, he piled pillows up against the door jamb, uh, up high along the sides and along the bottom. So if there was like somebody passing in the hallway, just eavesdropping, uh, it would make it more difficult for them. The stories began to appear, and then there's a period of time before he then self-identifies. In that gap there, it's my understanding that NSA had a very good idea who that was, what he had done, and then it's, it's a simple step from there to begin to use all the tools available to the U.S. government as to where he might be.
When he wanted to access his laptops, um, he had a big red hood uh, that he would put over his head and over his uh, computer so that when he was put in these passwords, he was scared that somebody might be able to see him through the window or maybe there was a hidden camera in the room. It's the greatest loss of secrets in our nation's history. And so that certainly was energizing the other parts of the US government to do everything they could to get him, and especially the materials, back before there was any more harm. How far was the US willing to go based on your professional experience in the intelligence community? For me, it was a question of, could the government feel every copy of this material could be stopped at a single point? And if that point had presented itself, uh, I don't know what they would have done. That it was even possible that they might try to kill me. He was incredibly edgy. He was nervous. And I remember uh, there was a fire alarm went off. Uh, and he wondered, was this a tactic to get him out of his room? Always hovering above everything we were over, everything we were doing was the possibility that at any given moment there could be a knock on the door that would put an end to our interaction. The time, it was extremely tense. Um, every day, myself and Glenn would see Snowden at the mirror. We didn't expect him to be, to be there. We assumed that this guy, they must be hunting for him. What would you do if you were the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, the director of the National Security Agency? And you knew there was an individual out there who was about to expose evidence that you had committed serious crimes. And you had the resources available to stop this person, even if it meant using lethal force. What would you do? So I know for a fact that the US government was uh, very angry at Mr. Snowden. His, his safety and also his life was, uh, was put at risk. Would you know that? I do know. The idea that he could somehow um, evade the US for very much longer it seemed inconceivable to us. And every time we interviewed him, we thought, well, that's the last time we'll see him. We've got to make the most of this because we won't get the chance to speak to him tomorrow. He won't be there. For many years, Edward Snowden worked at NSA headquarters near Washington, D.C., just miles from where he grew up. I saw him in the shadow of the National Security Agency, literally it was in, in the area of Fort Meade. Uh, he was there. I picked him up and we went out to dinner. The Snowden family has a long history of military service dating back to colonial times. Edward Snowden had an impressive career in America's intelligence community. By the age of 27, he'd gained access to its deepest secrets. He just seemed almost depressed, and I was very concerned about him. It was not the Ed that I knew. What Snowden couldn't tell his father during that dinner was that he'd discovered NSA documents that disturbed him. One of the key things that actually motivated me was the growing realization that we, in the United States government, um, were increasingly making decisions that departed from the rule of law. I assumed that maybe there was something going on between him and his long-term partner, uh, Lindsay Mills, which really concerned me because I knew that he loved her very much. And I uh, gave him a hug. You know, it was, you know, I love you, Dad. I love you, son. What Snowden disclosed wasn't information. He disclosed how we collected information. In other words, he didn't reveal a bucket of water. He revealed the plumbing. He revealed how we gather, process, and distribute water. And therefore, that's going to have a, a really harmful effect on American intelligence for a very long time. Mr. President, thank you for those kind words and for the confidence that you and Ambassador Negroponte... No one played a more important role in creating the NSA we know today than General Michael Hayden. 
He was given the job by George W. Bush with a mandate to stop at nothing to stop terrorism. When I returned from Korea in 1999 to take the position at NSA... Michael Hayden, former director of the NSA and CIA, uh, ran a program called Stellar Wind, where the communications of anyone in America uh, could be collected en masse under the pretext of preventing terrorism. If you're asking me to, to, to delve into my deepest emotions, it, it was the arrogance of an individual who looked upon the activity of the National Security Agency and believed that his legal and ethical judgment trumped the judgment of his co-workers, his leadership, the American president, the American Congress, and the American court system. I thought to myself, what kind of man is this? How can someone justify the violation of the rights of an entire nation without even a law to lean on? How do we come back from a situation in which the most senior officials in a democracy are acting against the interests of the public in secret? Snowden would have to have believed his judgment trumped all of those in order to create the kind of moral righteousness that he claims. That's pretty arrogant. My name's Ed Snowden. I'm uh, 29 years old. I work for Booz Allen Hamilton as an infrastructure analyst for NSA. We build massive NSA surveillance programs to collect phone records and internet data on a scale that many people never imagined. I don't, I don't welcome leaks. Journalists have been searching far and wide across the territory. Where is he? It's almost certain that he is still here in Hong Kong. Hid from the US intelligence services. This is the most serious hemorrhaging of legitimate American secrets in the history of my country. We've never seen anything like this before. In the, for us in Hong Kong, it was about three or four in the morning. Uh, so we had a couple hours sleep, and then we woke up, and there was pandemonium. Where in the world is Edward Snowden? So my boss called me, but she said, something urgent happened, Lavinia. Come to the office immediately. As soon as Edward Snowden revealed himself as the whistleblower, he set off a catch-me-if-you-can hunt by the U.S. government and a where-is-he-now guessing game for the media. The whole world now had a name and face to attach to the revelations. But so did the FBI. And I'm sure they're going to be uh, very busy for the next week. Uh, I've been... Uh... In the interview Snowden posted on the Guardian website, there was a clue as to where he might be staying. A view out of a hotel window. From this video, we can tell there were two pylons of Qingyi Bridge. So from this view, this one is, the, the one on the left is bigger than the one on the right. So I went to um, Google Map and used Google Earth, trying to figure out from which perspective can Qingyi Bridge look like that? The consequences of uh, if, if the media had known where Mr. Snowden was from that time onward, um, it would have been a, a direct link for the NSA, the U.S. government, uh, any, any of the U.S. government agencies to identify where my client was at the time. He was alarmed, he was upset that any time the CIA could come uh, crashing through that door. Everyone was chasing after this story. Everyone was so desperate. Everyone was desperately hoping to find Snowden. I want to get him uh, caught and brought back for trial. I think the chase is on. To leak that amount of material, that sensitive, and then stand up in front of the whole world and say, this is who I am and here's what I did, is a virtual guarantee that you're going to end up in, in a cage for the next several decades, if not longer. You can't come forward against the world's most powerful intelligence agencies and uh, be completely free from risk because they're such powerful adversaries. That this was the biggest media story on the planet at the time. There's a likelihood that media would arrive there. 
he needs to leave the hotel immediately and just to leave everything behind. When I went to Hong Kong, I didn't intend to get out of this safely. You know, this wasn't about me. I didn't care what happened to me. My part of the job was finished. The journalists were probably going to be there in a matter of minutes. And they just occupied the lobby, and they were hunting me, saying, where was Snowden? Where was Snowden? A bit, a bit like a, a bright siren, you know, declaring to everybody, oh, here's, here's the man uh, of interest. Ten thousand kilometers away, in London, there was one thing the U.S. government might be happy about. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange was not involved in the Snowden revelations. Well, I, sitting at my desk, uh, certainly had the authorities to to wiretap anyone from you or your. Assange has been confined to the Ecuadorian embassy in London since June 2012. The U.S. government saw him as out of commission. Let's look at the situation for Edward Snowden. 29-year-old young man in a foreign jurisdiction that he had no experience with, the subject of the largest intelligence manhunt the world has ever seen. And the realities were, for Edward Snowden, knew he was going to be smashed. Our other news today, and the man who leaked details of a secret telephone and internet surveillance program in the USA has disappeared in Hong Kong. Snowden had fled the hotel and was now hiding in the apartment of local supporters. The whereabouts are now unknown of Edward Snowden, who was a contract worker for the CIA. He's not been seen since he checked out. And at that moment, he reached out and asked us for help. With WikiLeaks, Snowden hoped he had found a team that was a match for the NSA. He knew the US was investigating WikiLeaks for espionage and terrorism. Years of surveillance had left WikiLeaks no option but to protect their communications through encryption something Snowden considered vital. Assange and his colleagues only agreed to appear in this film on condition WikiLeaks lawyers be permitted to vet their interviews. Sarah Harrison, a journalist at WikiLeaks, was busy running an election campaign in Australia when she got a call from London. I spoke to people from work and they said, have you seen this thing about Snowden? And I was like, what's wrong with the mountain in Wales? <laughs> and then they're like, look online, look online. So I looked and yeah, um, he'd, he'd gone public uh, at that stage. A video had gone out on The Guardian. At that moment when, when I first heard his name, I didn't for a moment imagine I would be spending four months with him. Although to the outside world it looked like a hurricane with statements uh, from the White House and stories appearing in the newspaper and a lot of interest about what he was doing in Hong Kong, I knew that, that actually this was the calm moment um, and that the, the real storm was just about to come and he would be sucked into this vortex within two weeks uh, of imprisonment, arrest. I'd seen Chelsea Manning go through a similar experience. After three years of solitary confinement without trial, the US military's most famous whistleblower, Private First Class Bradley Manning, finally... Until Snowden, Chelsea Manning's leak of American government documents had been the biggest loss of secrets in American history. WikiLeaks had published the documents, but had to stand by and watch as Manning was caught and held in conditions characterized by the UN as cruel, inhuman, and degrading. The US tried very hard to make Chelsea Manning a general deterrent uh, in its incredibly abusive treatment of him, psychological torture, and simply for communicating to the media. I knew about Chelsea Manning, you know, going into it. There was, there was never any question about how that case was going to be settled. And you were willing to put yourself in the same position? That's tough to vocalize. Um, Three days after Snowden went underground, Sarah Harrison landed in Hong Kong. She took charge of what was to become 
Operation Asylum. That there was a person by the name of Edward Snowden who had checked in and out, uh, but it's still not clear whether. What was particularly extraordinary, I think, was while all of these news organizations around the world, all of these publishers, were trying to get a piece of the story, there was only one publisher that actually said, "We want to help the source. We want to make sure he's okay. We want to make sure that no matter what happens." You know, he has somebody on his side, and that was WikiLeaks. If there was one thing I could change, um, it would have been whether we could have done more for Snowden. I did have a discussion with the editor, uh, Alan Rusbridger, and the US editor, Jeanine Gibson, about what we could do f for Snowden, whether we should be paying his hotel bills and whether we should be getting him legal advice. I, I wish we'd thought it through, and maybe if we had more time, we could have come up with something. You know, it was the US government versus WikiLeaks, and not just in the grand jury court, but right there on the ground in Hong Kong. Protect Snowden! Snowden blew the whistle on American efforts to spy on innocent citizens. Today, we all blew the whistle. Protect Snowden! The U.S. government has filed criminal charges against Edward Snowden. I think it was probably on my birthday <laughs> when the presents I got from the government was that they unsealed an indictment uh, against me. Edward Snowden has been charged with espionage, theft and conversion of government property. And what was extraordinary about the indictment was the fact that they included espionage charges. Now, they knew that I wasn't working for any foreign government. That was clear from the beginning. Uh, they knew that I was working with journalists, uh, and that the recipient of the information was the public at large. Washington now wants help from Hong Kong officials because Snowden's been hiding in the Chinese territory since unleashing the revelations about the National Security Agency. The charge of espionage increased the pressure on the Hong Kong authorities to act and made Snowden's position even more dangerous. It meant that if Snowden was caught, he could face the death penalty back home in the US. Snowden took the risk of leaving his hideout and met his lawyer who warned him. Sooner or later, Hong Kong would hand him over to the US where he could expect the same treatment as Private Manning. In terms of uh, Private Manning situation, uh, clearly, he had been subjected to cruel and inhuman, degrading treatment or punishment. As, as such, this raised grave concerns about what would happen to Mr. Snowden if he was returned to uh, the United States. Snowden could not be sure if the Hong Kong authorities would do as the U.S. was demanding and arrest him right away. Hong Kong citizens were on the streets calling him a hero, but the Hong Kong authorities were in an unpredictable situation. Snowden knew there was always the possibility the central government in Beijing would intervene and sacrifice him in a deal with the US. The things that were told to us was that the feeling within the government was that they just wanted it, the Hong Kong government was that they just wanted it gone. He was a hot potato, they just didn't want to have to deal with it. They were either going to upset the people of Hong Kong or they were going to upset Beijing, and it was just too problematic. The Hong Kong government decided to play for time. Rather than arrest Snowden, they decided to wait for the proper paperwork to arrive. But Snowden was still in danger. With the, the nature of the disclosures he made, um, there was a, a real and immediate risk that uh, he could be arrested in Hong Kong. One of the reasons Snowden was so vulnerable was that a White House task force was working the phones and putting pressure on decision makers in Hong Kong. Since we learned that Mr. Snowden was in Hong Kong, U.S. authorities have been in continual contact with their Hong Kong counterparts at the working and senior levels. The U.S. was certain if the Hong Kong government decided to arrest Snowden, 
they would not have problems locating him. Look, the Chinese have a wonderful intelligence service. I would lose all respect for my Chinese colleagues if they did not have very good knowledge as to what was going on. Although our analysis was that it would face serious consequences and should immediately leave Hong Kong, uh, he was reluctant to do that until uh, it seemed like there was no other choice because he wanted to explore different options and so on. And this was driving us mad. Helix had been working out various options of where he would be safe, where he could go, different people's opinions around the world. But I mean, it was his decision, it's his life. The border is open, we've got to go. Now, now's a chance, the border is open, could close, you know, at any time. Then something happened that narrowed the options for Snowden. The request for his extradition arrived from the United States on a Friday night. Would the Hong Kong Justice Ministry wait until Monday to issue a warrant? Who could know? They would make a decision and then they would act upon that decision. We needed to move. Time, the, the clock was ticking, very definitely then. You know, Mr. Snowden um, was in a difficult position where uh, he could be arrested at any time. What Edward was concerned about is knowing the exact status of the border. So he, he agreed that he should leave, but as soon as he went to passport control, maybe he would be arrested. So he was very reluctant to actually leave because that would cut short his, his last time, his last uh, hours of freedom. Attorney General Eric Holder placed a phone call stressing the importance of the matter and urging Hong Kong to honor our request for Snowden's arrest. It was the end. It's, he couldn't wait to continue to assess the situation. He had to make a decision. That was the moment where it all came together or it didn't. Either our plan worked, our negotiations had worked, and we would get on that flight, or it wouldn't. We, over the weekend, the United States uh, has been in touch via diplomatic and law enforcement channels uh, with a number of countries uh, which Mr. Snowden might transit or that could serve as final destinations. This was the largest intelligence manhunt the world has ever seen. So the US was throwing everything, all its resources at this thing. Uh, so we needed some way of splitting those resources because we didn't want them all focused on, on his flight out. Well, he bought a ticket to India as cover. It was booked using his credit card for two days after the actual asylum flight. In all, WikiLeaks bought more than a dozen tickets in Snowden's name on flights leaving Hong Kong. They hoped the US wouldn't figure out which flight he and Harrison were aiming for. I was worried about missing the flight. We were running late, basically, due to the fact that I had been printing all of our airline tickets and there was an issue with the printer and just sort of these stupid things. We're advising these governments that Mr. Snowden is wanted on serious felony charges, and as such, he should not be allowed to proceed in any further international travel, uh, other than is necessary. I spoke to Edward the day before, and I told him that the, the highest risk is in the airport. He was getting very nervous, and his lawyer kept calling. I think he worried too that the whole thing would collapse. I don't think the US would assassinate him in the airport, but I don't think that would happen. But that they might kind of make a fuss um, and lean on airport authorities to hold him and, and detain him. And then the State Department could bring all its assets to bear. There have been repeated engagements by the US Department of State and US Consulate General in Hong Kong. There have been repeated engagements by the FBI with their law enforcement counterpart.
you could also be racing to getting captured, right? I mean, you're also... Yeah, running towards them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm quite sure that that airport was being watched, so... Ultimately, as I walked up to the, uh, the checkpoint counter, um, the only thing I was thinking is that I should remember to smile. The guy took our passports, which is obviously the normal thing to do. So mine was sort of fine, and then Nathan's one sort of took a while, and again, reaching for the phone, and a um, little bit confused, and the computer made a funny sound. And <laughs> um, so, yeah, so again, I'm not quite sure what was going on there, but I was getting very nervous. His lawyer did sort of start stepping forward to sort of see what was going on. On June 17th, Hong Kong authorities acknowledged receipt of our request. Despite repeated inquiries, Hong Kong authorities did not respond with any request for additional documents or information, stating only that the matter was under review and refusing to elaborate. What was under review was that there was a mistake in the American paperwork. In the rush to prevent him from leaving Hong Kong, the State Department got Edward Snowden's middle name wrong. It is not Edward James Snowden, it is Edward Joseph Snowden. Our people are meticulous in processing legal documents. They had to double check the spelling, make sure that uh, they are catching the right person sought by the US authorities. I don't think our, our authorities deliberately held up uh, the arrest, but um, we need to take maybe a few days. But a few days was not good enough for the US, you know. Mm. And apparently Snowden made use of the, uh, the, 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 the few days available to uh, work out his escape. As it happened, we were rushing our paperwork forward as Snowden's trying to leave Hong Kong to, to fly on to Russia. We made it easier for the Chinese and the people in Hong Kong to make the decision they made because of the delay. Because, you know, we've now done everything. You know, you've checked in, you've got through security, you've done the bag check, the passport check, you know, you boarded onto the plane, and then I was like, you're still not OK. I knew the schedule of the flight was meant to leave, and I was just watching the, the Hong Kong airport register to see, has the flight left, has the flight left, has the flight left? And it was late. It was 20 minutes late, so I was quite concerned. Well, then the other thing that made me very nervous was when we were um, waiting to take off, uh, we came from the gate and then we go up a bit and then we just stop and we're just waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting. And a straight to our breaking news for you this hour, Chinese sources have alleged that NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden is en route to Moscow from Hong Kong. If so, the whistleblower would have departed hours after Washington threatened the Chinese city-state with repercussions if it didn't arrest him. Hong Kong authorities requested additional information concerning the U.S. charges and evidence. The U.S. had been in communication with Hong Kong, and we were in the process of responding when we learned that Hong Kong had allowed the fugitive to leave. What is uh, clear is that um, at the time he left, the State Department did not cancel his passport. Maybe he should have cancelled, they should have cancelled his passports. They cancelled his passport after his departure. Then, so when he left Hong Kong, he was holding a valid US passport. It is very clear to me that the Hong Kong authorities knew the United States wanted to extradite Snowden from Hong Kong to the United States when Snowden is trying to leave the country. And on some made-up pretext, uh, misspelling of his middle name or something in the documents that we gave to the Hong Kong police, they allowed him to leave and to fly on to Russia. Is the administration embarrassed now that you can't track him down, that he's uh, this cat and mouse game that's going on for all the world to see? I think I've been very uh, clear about uh, the actions we've taken. We have known where he is and uh, believe we know where he is now, and, and uh, there are ongoing conversations about that.
We both sort of just sat there, like we didn't, really didn't say much until that moment where it actually, we were out of the airspace and there was a visible <sighs> And then that's when we first like sort of had like any real conversation. And what did he, he, he ask, what did he ask you or what, what? Uh, pretty much his first question was, why did you do this? Why did you risk everything just to help me? Um, I was sort of saying, um, yeah, but you were, you were wanting help or something. And he said, yeah, I was wanting help and advice. I didn't think that WikiLeaks would send like a ninja in to get me out, um, which was funny enough. But then about two minutes later, like a fly buzzes past and I just have never done it before in my life and I'll probably never do it again. But I just went, oh, that's annoying and literally plucked it out of the air. He was like, you really are a ninja. <laughs> Sarah's probably the most incredibly brave woman I know. She's somebody who is there through the hardest times, uh, in a period of incredible risk. And she put her life on the line for somebody who is a complete stranger to her. There's a lot of information uh, floating around here. Organize it all for us. Tell us what's exactly going on. We're led to believe that Edward Snowden has safely left Hong Kong and is currently in the sky somewhere over the Russian city of Omsk in an A330. He's due to arrive here. We are led to believe at Sheremetyevo Airport later on Sunday. That's, uh, that's all rumor and hearsay at the moment, but it's thought that his final destination will not be Moscow. At that moment, there was a race for the interpretation of what had happened. Uh, so had he left as a fugitive, busted through the Hong Kong airport, whatever, so you had a fugitive on an aeroplane, um, that was one possible spin that we would see from the media machine. Uh, and it was very important to counter that spin because his whole flight path would have been closed down because countries and airlines would go, oh, we can't accept this fugitive on our flight. Uh, so we put out as soon as he was in safe airspace that no, uh, he had left Hong Kong, that he had left Hong Kong legally, uh, that he was accompanied by uh, legal advisors. Uh, so this uh, flight path wouldn't be closed down. As you can see on this map, the flight that has uh, so reportedly has Snowden aboard it has almost, almost reached its destination here in Moscow, scheduled to land in the Russian capital within minutes. The plane, believed to be carrying Edward Snowden, touching down in Moscow. He's on the run, but where will he end up? He's not thought to have permission to stay. The expectation is that tomorrow he'll get on a plane to Latin America. The exact route he'll take is unclear. Breaking news this hour. WikiLeaks claims one of its legal advisors accompanying Snowden after the whistleblowing organization secured papers, a safe exit, and asylum, quote, in an unnamed democratic state. Even if he does find a country willing to offer him asylum, there's no guarantee he'll actually arrive at his desired destination. You know, the first woman, she's just some normal check-in woman, you know? She's like, your passport doesn't work. Sorry, I can't issue your boarding pass. We managed to get him out of Hong Kong, uh, but when he landed in the Moscow airport, the uh, American government had cancelled uh, his passport. Um, and now they, <clears throat> now the Americans make a lot of pressure uh, on other countries to stop him. You know, it was actually really surprising to me to discover that the U.S. cancelled my passport. They tried to freeze me in place. Um, when I was in jurisdictions which wouldn't be considered particularly friendly to the United States government, that, that always puzzled me. Canceling Snowden's passport was the first step in an FBI Plan B. Now, they would just need to pick him up. In a small airfield in Manassas, Virginia, far from prying eyes, a former CIA rendition plane prepared for takeoff. Its mission to transport a fugitive back to the United States. But at Moscow Airport, Snowden's escape to Cuba still seemed possible. The gate had not yet closed. 
Julian Assange had asked a diplomat from the Ecuadorian embassy in London to accompany Snowden on the flight and protect him en route to secure asylum. The diplomat just needed to find Snowden at the gate and explained that he now enjoyed diplomatic protection from Ecuador. The Ecuadorian ambassador visited the Sheremetyevo airport on Sunday and spent... But at Terminal F, the presence of hundreds of media people had created pandemonium. The diplomat couldn't find Snowden. Julian Assange began to play switchboard. He tried to bring Snowden and Sarah Harrison together with the diplomat without alerting the press go to the uh, information desk or help desk and ask them to put out an announcement uh, asking that Sarah Harrison uh, come, come to see you. Though they finally managed to meet, the diplomat could not help Edward Snowden. Without a valid passport, he was not allowed to board the plane. The flight to Cuba left without him. positive sign as far as the U.S. government is concerned that Mr. Snowden did not get on, has not gotten on any, air, any airplane? <clears throat> we have communicated to the Russians uh, our hope that they will look at all ex uh, options available to them to expel Mr. Snowden back to the United States. Just a few hours after Edward Snowden landed in Moscow, the U.S. prisoner transportation plane landed in Copenhagen, waiting on standby. Was its mission to transport Edward Snowden back to America? Uh, almost as soon as he arrived in Moscow, the FBI contacted me. I chose to speak to them for, for four hours. As a matter of fact, one of the agents was starting to dose. Uh, I, I, you know, nothing, you know, I, I, I shared everything I, I possibly could. I wanted to help. Back in Terminal F, the Russian authorities offered Snowden a secret deal. He could leave the airport right away on one condition, that he agreed to work with the FSB, the Russian intelligence service. They asked once they had approached, I mean, it's kind of unimaginable to think that they wouldn't. He didn't give anything to the Russians at all, and he certainly didn't cooperate with them or give them anything in any way whatsoever. Um, How do you know? I, I was with him the whole time, so I would stake my entire life on the fact that he did not give anything to anybody. Russian President Vladimir Putin refused Snowden entry into Russia. He and Harrison would have to fend for themselves in the airport's transit zone. And then we were in this room for a month. We didn't have a window. Or a shower. Uh, this, these were representatives from the FBI from the D.C. area who I, I suspect were working very closely at that point with the State Department. And, uh, uh, you know, they, they just wanted to talk and they said, would you be interested in, uh, would you consider traveling to Moscow, flying to Moscow to meet with your son? And I said, absolutely. They had mentioned at one point when we were talking about the details, and I, I'm not going to get into in, in, in too far into specifics. Uh, they had mentioned to me that, well, you, you understand that uh, <clears throat> once we get there, uh, we're going to need to check your son out to make sure he's okay medically. And, and I laughed. I said, you've got to be kidding. It concerns me to hear the things that I've heard about the activities of the FBI at that time, uh, whether it was their plan to get my father onto an airplane at the Moscow airport and then use him uh, to sort of lure me onto the plane in this wacky strategy and then sort of slam shut the door of the airplane and, you know, fly back to D.C.
new revelations based on Snowden's documents were appearing every day. Throughout Western Europe, there was popular support for Edward Snowden, and the drama of his flight was on the nightly news. I guess if you know the answer to this one, you will be the subject of a truth. For many in Europe, Snowden deserved protection, not a prison cell. Hopeful that he could harness public opinion and get out of Russia, Snowden filed asylum applications to Western European democracies, 21 of them. The State Department was making the phones ring in every government office and every European government uh, agency um, where they had a phone number, you know, anywhere they had a business card that was sitting in a Rolodex, that person got a call. And they said, this man will not receive asylum in Europe. But you would not deny that there have been um, conversations and discussions about Mr. Snowden, his whereabouts, and the consequences well, of, no, of, no, of Matt, posting I don't, him. Correct? I don't think we've at all denied that we've been in contact through a range okay, of diplomatic would, channels. All right. so I think Poland was the first to deny, uh, followed by France. Uh, Italy said they weren't likely to respond or simply didn't respond. The vast majority of European governments did something which I think was particularly illustrative which is they took no position at all. All right, but, so, but you, you would just object to the characterization that it's bullying or to arm twisting. Is that, that is correct, yes? I think that's clear. A glimmer of hope after living in limbo for weeks, Venezuela and Bolivia offered the NSA leaker asylum after European countries rejected his official request. Venezuela came out very strongly. We couldn't actually get there because all the Western countries were saying no and not offering any help. There was no possibility for safe passage um, or to like physically get to Latin America safely. There were several plans to get him out of Moscow. We looked at private jets, we looked at presidential jets. We had a tip-off inside the US administration that they th would be fairly confident about taking down the private jet. They'd be a little bit less confident in relation to commercial airliners. And they were not very confident at all in relation to a presidential jet. With Snowden still stuck in the transit zone, he watched on Russian TV as one of the few presidents of the world prepared to offer him asylum landed in Moscow. President Evo Morales of Bolivia had arrived for an international summit of gas exporting countries. Just before leaving Moscow, Evo Morales left no doubt that his country would welcome Snowden. If Snowden asks for political asylum, will you give it to him? Yes. Why not? Given what President Morales had said, there was a strong suspicion in, within my government that there was at least a possibility that Morales would be happy to take Snowden with him. When President Morales left for the airport, the FBI thought Snowden might be with him. They believed Snowden was escaping on the presidential jet. According to the Vienna Convention, a presidential plane enjoys a special diplomatic status. It's like a flying piece of territory from the home country. Bolivian officials said France and Portugal wouldn't let the Bolivian president's plane land and refuel on their territories because of rumors that Snowden could have been on board that plane. Government to government, express your concern, express your belief, why you think this man may be on that plane. Uh, express that to a friend, how serious you view the situation, and then you ask the friend to take a course of action, and apparently they did. Well, they, they said that uh, you don't have permission to enter a French airspace, and we tell the control, and this is the diplomatic clearance clear uh -huh. number. And they said, well, yeah, that one was canceled. My government went to other European governments and 
because of their control over airspace, forced the president's plane to land. Now, again, this is absolutely unprecedented. I was in my room. I was looking at my laptop, and I was reading the news. And at first, I didn't believe it. His jet was ultimately forced to land and underwent a search over rumors whistleblower Edward Snowden was aboard. Uh, I couldn't believe that the United States government would go so far as to ground the diplomatic jet carrying a head of state to search it for, for somebody like me. Latin America united with their condemnation. Social media erupted with claims the U.S. was behind the move and Europe a puppet. And that was something that was so physical and so obvious. It was like the tide going out on the power relations between uh, Western Europe and the United States. You could see the underlying power structure, the rocks on this shore that represented the true nature of the relationship because he could see that actually Western Europe wasn't going into bat for him at all. In fact, Western Europe was playing uh, on, the other, on the other side. We consciously laid false trails in relation to the Morales flight. Sometimes there would be, you know, there would be calls to ambassadors on open telephone lines, for example, including from this embassy. You know, we were trying to split up the surveillance resources, uh, force the United States to consider the Morales flight. Do you think that the one could imagine disinformation? That's, 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 an in, that's an interesting question, and I must admit I hadn't considered it before, but it's always, always a possibility, sure. I didn't know that that diversion would end up in such an extraordinary outcome. The whole Morales flight also kind of helped the Russian giving him asylum. And it did, and it, it, it reinforced the, uh, the image of Snowden as victim. Snowden as the pursued? Yeah. So, if you were sitting on the other side of the mm -hmm. fence to trap the Americans, would that have been a wise move? I, again, I hadn't thought of it until you raised it, but it's incredibly clever. Yeah. Yeah. It was, I think, a crystallizing moment where for everybody, even those people like myself who are inclined to believe that the United States government is a fundamentally good force. But when we saw that happen, I think everybody went, is this the kind of action that good guys take? It ended up to be a huge embarrassment. Yes. <laughs> Not as big as the original embarrassment, losing all the secrets, but yes. Federal Migration Service has confirmed publicly that they have issued Mr. Snowden temporary asylum for one year and allowed him to leave the airport. We are extremely... The light physically hurt my eyes. And I remember actually standing and staring out of the window there and being like, um, almost tearful to see the sky, you know? And it seemed sort of suddenly extraordinarily amazing and beautiful to see all of the sky. We are extremely disappointed that the Russian government would take this step despite our very clear and lawful requests in public and in private to have Mr. Snowden expelled to the United States to face the charges against him. Mr. Snowden is not a whistleblower. Russian and American relations, already strained, dropped to their lowest level in years. 
the lack of cooperation between the two great powers haunts the world until today. So many people like me would not contemplate amnesty or plea bargaining or anything else to bring Snowden back. There are 100,000 people in the American intelligence community who didn't violate their oath of office. If my government participates in any kind of welcome home for Mr. Snowden that even, even smells of that kind of approach, it would alienate this body of people on whom both the safety and the liberty of my nation depends. That's not a good idea. Anybody who's ever embarrassed a great power is never going to be safe. I mean, as long as people feel a sense of retaliation, as long as people feel like they have to send messages and set examples not to mess with us, um, dissenters are going to be at risk. To be leaving the airport under those circumstances, to have seen everything that had transpired in those two months, uh, and then just to be struck with what was a completely perfect, warm, and bright day, you know, a seasonable day, normal life outside, you know, you, you hear uh, the birds, you know, simple things like that. Um, insects, traffic. It's like stepping into a, a larger world. I want to get him uh, caught and brought back for trial.